Is 2024 the year of the Linux desktop for you? Well, for me, that date is 2008. Now, granted, I'd started using Linux in the 90s and had a sysadmin mail job all the way in 1998, mail server admin in Linux. So I've got a lot of experience before I decided to move to Linux on the desktop. But the reality is a lot more people are looking at this because Microsoft has become increasingly hostile to you, the end user. Whether it's switching settings you didn't want switched or trying to push you to cloud subscriptions that you didn't ask for or signing up for things just to be able to sign into your Windows. This is a big pain point. And Wendell from Level 1 Text and Steve from Gamers Nexus did a great job called Microsoft is Killing Windows. And I think there's a lot of accuracy in that and it has a lot of people looking, whether it's for privacy reasons or just control reasons at other alternatives. Now, the reality is there's a big challenge. It's not about having a million games available or a million applications available on Linux. It's whether or not the application you want to use or the game you want to play works on Linux. And that can be a non-starter and I fully acknowledge that. And if that is the case for you, it may not be the right time to switch. For me, 2008 was that time to switch. We're going to talk about my journey to switching and talk about the applications I use and maybe give some data points along the way that might help you think about this journey yourself and decide if it's ready for you. So let's get started. Now, while years ago, finding hardware that worked well with Linux might have been a challenge, here in 2024, pretty much everything works out of the box. This is my ThinkStation P620, and it just worked from first load. No special drivers had to be hunted down. Nothing extra had to be downloaded. Everything built into Pop! OS ran as fine. It should work fine with Ubuntu as well. Now, when it comes to laptops, I've done quite a few ThinkPads and other laptops, and the same thing. Modern laptops with modern hardware don't seem to have any of the compatibility problems, and yes, the Wi-Fi seems to work fine. Best way to test this, of course, is to pop in a USB, boot up the distro of your choice, and see if the live version works. If the live version works, go ahead and install that live version, and that's an easy way to tell if you have proper compatibility. This particular system is my editing workstation. That's why it has this NVIDIA RTX 8 6000 in here and the a6000 works fine with linux as well and i before this had done some custom builds and once again never had an issue from the audio adapter to the built-in 10 gig networking in this everything works right out of the box now here's where the debate comes in quite a bit is which distribution to start with and i've wandered around between a few of them but let's roll back to red hat when I started working with Linux, it was when Red Hat came on floppies. So I've got a lot of experience long before I chose to put Linux on the desktop. Around 1999, as my job was related to managing some Linux admin stuff via mail servers and other things and databases that were, well, kind of interesting things that I was running back then. You What's crazy to think about is that was 25, 26 years ago. Wow, I'm getting old. But I've obviously come from a long Linux background. And while I did play around a bit with the early days of Linux desktop, it was a absolute terrible experience. And it was more of a novelty to show you that you had the technical ability and acumen to run it. It was a much less practical experience back then. So I decided to take that technical experience and try Ubuntu for the desktop. And I think Ubuntu and probably around version 8 uh, or 8.10, so it was 804, 810 when I started. I don't have the exact date that I fully committed that I'm using Linux on the desktop, but I found that Ubuntu worked really well. I thought it was a lot of polish on there. And over the years, Ubuntu just kept getting better. It was just a better desktop experience. And because it was essentially forked off of Debian, the apt commands that I was so familiar with and used for my day-to-day -day usage and things I did as a business or did personally with Linux, it made it really easy for me to jump to the command line in a comfortable environment and apt get my install way to success. But eventually I thought the desktop wasn't great. I wasn't huge on the Unity desktop, so I tried KD Neon. Now, part of my other reason for using KD Neon was the customizations and all the other fun stuff, but that was also because I was using Caden Live and started a YouTube channel. So there are some videos where I talked about KD Neon, and I think I've left some of those up. They're older videos, and they're up for more nostalgia reasons. They're not really practical here today. But KDE is definitely just that extra level of customization, but also kind of messiness that came with it. And too many options sometimes aren't really a good thing. This brings me all the way to Pop! OS. To me, Pop! OS feels like a well-polished operating system. So they took Ubuntu and made it a little better. They made the shortcut keys a little better. And I said, okay, it's still got the wonderful apt system that I'm familiar with. It's going to be any problem that I have or any challenge I run into 
matching with a challenge where Ubuntu. So I don't have to search for how do I do this in Pop! OS. I can simply say, how do I do this in Ubuntu? And current version I'm running is 22.04. So if I say, how do I do this in Ubuntu 22.04? I'll find an answer that's probably 99% match for what I'm looking for if I run into any challenges. So Pop! OS has just really set the bar really high in terms of nice user experience, good shortcuts, and that wonderful compatibility with the Ubuntu world, which is popular enough that I can find the answer to any of the weird little problems that I might run into. But now let's talk about the weird little problems. The first one's going to be that the Linux experience was just not that great years ago. And I kind of solved those problems by running VirtualBox. VirtualBox worked wonderful for this. I could just run Windows apps inside of VirtualBox by loading an entire operating system, virtualizing it, and having a computer fast enough to run Windows in a contained environment to run those apps. That was my crutch, if you will, that allowed me to start all the way back in 2008. It was not practical. It's not something I would recommend for a great user experience, but as well, those gets the job done and hey, it works and it's kind of cool that you can do that. Kept, I kept moving forward and slowly I'm starting to see more and more apps. And that's where I want to get to today is what the status is today. And the apps have really moved over but there's still some quirkiness that makes it a little bit of a challenge for people to switch. And I just want to talk about now some of the apps that I'm using here. And before I talk about the apps, I want to talk about how the apps are installed. And you might be thinking, sudo apt get install Wireshark seems reasonable. And that's probably how you would install all apps. And well, most apps will install that way. Some you may want to use Flatpak for, but you have to be careful. Jeff from Crab Computing did a great job on this, talking about the challenges, especially newcomers to Linux will face when they decide that they want to install things through the packages system that may be built in. Now, I like the packages built in for the apt packages, but there's also the Pop! OS store here. And sometimes, and we'll give an example right here, we're going to look at OBS. You have OBS Studio, and you can install it via Deb or Flatpak. And I believe it defaults to Flatpak for most things, but OBS Studio is especially one, and as Jeff pointed out, you really want the Deb package for it, and if you're not sure why, well, that's where things get confusing, and the why is really simple. When you install Flatpak, it is a sandbox version of the app that has a limited scope of permissions, which sounds like what you want, but the reason you might not want something like that, and you may want just a normal Deb package to be installed is access to hardware. The capture cards or other devices that you may want OBS to directly pull from will have a problem with the flat pack. And overcoming that problem is a matter of tuning the flat pack parameters in order to, well, make that easier. Now, the reason for flat pack and why it exists was to solve some interdependency issues. Matter of fact, it's one of the reasons, and let me close this here. Something like Caden Live for video editing is better on a flat pack. I have no need for Caden Live to have any real direct access outside of using the video card to render, but it works better as a flat pack because of some dependency issues. So if you install it as a dev package, sometimes it seems to get held behind because there'll be a dependency in the operating system in the dev package that doesn't allow it. So there's only those few little exceptions there, but I will list the apps that I'm using and how I installed them. And mostly it has to do with things that need direct access to hardware. Browsers are an exception because you're probably thinking they don't need direct access to hardware, but the exception is if you install a browser flat pack, you may have problems with like USB security keys. So I do install those as a package from the system. Now let's talk about the packages themselves and what I'm using here. And I'll leave this list in the description below so you can just look through the list. But this is actually LogSeq you're looking at for the list. This is an application I use quite a bit. I'm going to do, or maybe by the time you're watching this video, have done a video on LogSeq. This is essentially my second brain where I keep, well, all my notes and scripts for videos or what I'm going to talk about or lists I may have for things. So you'll find the videos that I mentioned right here, which be in the description, and you'll find these apps I use. So LogSeq, once again, no access to direct hardware. So Flatpak is perfectly fine. Slack, use it for business, use it for business communication. Works great inside there. Same with Signal Messenger. There's not really any reason it needs to be installed as a dev package. Chrome and Firefox, I do install from the apt-kit install command line. They're built into the repository that's provided by Pop! OS. So there's nothing special you have to do there. And that's the same for pretty much everything on this list that I install with app packages, including LibreOffice. And I guess the question is, does it make me old that I still like my document stored locally. I don't necessarily need them in a cloud or need them in something like Nextcloud as an application. I still use a lot of local apps that way. And 
including my documents. That just makes it a lot easier. VirtualBox, app package is fine. Remia Remote Desktop, kind of a cool remote desktop tool that allows you to connect to multiple systems at once. It works well. Uh, KMI Money, did a video years ago on it. Uh, it's still relevant because KMI Money has changed very little. It's still what I use for Lawrence systems in terms of managing a ledger and profit and loss. Draw.io, got a video on that. You can use that in the web browser. You can use it as a flat pack. Either way works perfectly fine. Bitwarden. I like the desktop app just being one extra place I use it. So flat pack works great for that. Now, creative apps, this may or may not be for you, depending on if you're like me and doing a lot of creative things. We have GIMP, which is certainly not Photoshop. I would never try to convince anyone otherwise. OBS Studio, as I mentioned, needs access to direct hardware. So we have app package on that. Um, Audacity, just out of habit, app get installed at Audacity. Been using it for years for audio editing. Gaiden Live, it seems to be more up to date on the flat pack version. I don't use this as video editing as much anymore, but I still leave it installed because sometimes I play with it and see how it's coming along. Um, uh, Shutter for screenshots. I love Shutter. It's great. It makes doing screenshots and putting an arrow on something really, really easy to do. And DaVinci Resolve. This has their own special installer, but the installer is compatible with Linux just in general. It actually works on a lot of different distributions. And I will mention, this is one of those hangups inside of Linux where you can't do proper audio. Uh, Jeff covers this as well. It just doesn't support all the different codecs because DaVinci relies on the codecs of the underlying OS. The licensed codecs are not available in Linux. Therefore, they're not available in DaVinci when it's running on Linux. That is a minor issue, but there's ways around that. Just make sure you're using the proper audio type waveforms that are supported in DaVinci. Sync thing, done a video on this and I added this directly from the repositories. Deja Dupe, people ask me how I back things up. I really have Sync thing backing up everything in real time, but Deja Dupe is a good way to grab can just copies of all the files that, well, just so I have a snapshot in time version of it. And Barrier, this is one I want to mention because this is a really neat tool that allows me to take this computer and control other computers as if this is the KVM and I can control the keyboard and mouse. So it's not no V for the video, but I'll be able to swing over my mouse to another system. Uh, I'll leave a video that Veronica explains that I think is really good. It's uh, how I got to understand Barrier, how it works and why I like it so much. While starting my Linux journey in 2008 required such workarounds as running VirtualBox with Windows and those applications living within there, here in 2024, it's much easier because many applications have moved to being a browser interface and the other ones that haven't are Windows, Mac and Linux compatible. But the things moving to the browser has made things much more platform agnostic, which I think is great and is going to make the journey easier for a lot of people. But whether or not you're one of those people comes down to not the thousands of games or thousands of applications, but whether or not the applications you need will work in Linux. Adobe, they're the big elephant in the room. They don't care about supporting Linux. And if you're in the creative space and you're not moved over to something like DaVinci Resolve for editing or just Photoshop. I mean, it's an amazing tool. I'll admit for all the problems with Adobe, they still make a great product. They just have poor management in terms of the way they distribute that product, in my opinion, but I'm not going to get too off topic, but there's not a way to get around that. If you have to live in the creative suite that is Adobe, you're not going to find good Linux support on there. Maybe there's a future that you're going, Tom, remember when you said that and now Adobe adapted, but I don't see that future really soon, but it comes down to if you have those needs, you may not be able to switch to Linux. But I'm always curious, how's your journey coming? Have you decided Microsoft has, well, poked at you enough and changed things on you enough that you're switching to Linux? And if so, what distribution did you change? Also, for those of you longtime Linux people, quit hating on everyone who didn't choose the distribution that you love. But I'm sure there's already comments down below of why I shouldn't have chose Ubuntu or Pop! OS or any of the things I used in between. But I love hearing from you. How to my forums, forums.lawrencesystems.com, where we can have a more in-depth discussion on this and our topics. Matter of fact, there'll be a forum post link where I list the applications that I use. And that's a great place to engage with me, get a little bit more in-depth in case you have questions or topics and you want a little help with that switch to Linux journey. There's plenty of other people in the forums that'll help you along with it as well. All right. Thanks for coming and watching this video. Like and subscribe to see more content from the channel. And I'll see you around on whatever socials you can find me on at lawrencesystems.com.